Welcome back to our literary journey through the heartwarming and complex world of Louisa May, Alcott's Little Women. Today, we embark on a new adventure with the March sisters as we delve into the narration of chapters 26 to 28. As we continue to follow their lives, filled with challenges, triumphs, and the ever-present warmth of family bonds, we invite you to immerse yourself in the timeless themes that have made this novel a beloved classic across generations. In these chapters, we navigate through moments of joy, introspection, and the inevitable changes that come with growing up. Whether you're revisiting these tales or experiencing them for the first time, there's something truly special about the world Alcott has created for us. Before we begin, if you're enjoying our series, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you won't miss any of our upcoming episodes. And for those who love diving deep into the world of classic literature, we have a special gift for you a free full-length audiobook from Obsidian, river.com, visit obsidianriver.com slash gift to download your free audiobook and embark on another literary adventure. Now, let's turn the page to Chapter 26 and rejoin the March family in their journey of love, loss, and enduring sisterhood. Chapter 26 Artistic Attempts It takes people a long time to learn the difference between talent and genius, especially ambitious young men and women. Amy was learning this distinction through much tribulation. For, mistaking enthusiasm for inspiration, she attempted every branch of art with youthful audacity. For a long time, there was a lull in the mud pie business, and she devoted herself to the finest pen and ink drawing, in which she showed such taste and skill that her graceful handiwork proved both pleasant and profitable. But overstrained eyes, soon caused pen and ink to be laid aside for a bold attempt at poker sketching. While this attack lasted, the family lived in constant fear of a conflagration, for the odor of burning wood pervaded the house at all hours. Smoke issued from attic and shed with alarming frequency, red-hot pokers lay about promiscuously, and Hannah never went to bed without a pail of water and the dinner bell at her door, in case of fire. Raphael's face was found boldly executed on the underside of the molding board, and Bacchus on the head of a beer barrel. A chanting cherub adorned the cover of the sugar bucket, and attempts to portray Romeo and Juliet supplied kindlings for some time. From fire to oil was a natural transition for burnt fingers, and Amy fell to painting with undiminished ardor. An artist friend fitted her out with his cast-off palettes, brushes, and colors, and she daubed away, producing pastoral and marine views such as were never seen on land or sea. Her monstrosities in the way of cattle would have taken prizes at an agricultural fair, and the perilous pitching of her vessels would have produced seasickness in the most nautical observer if the utter disregard to all known rules of shipbuilding and rigging had not convulsed him with laughter at the first glance. Swarthy boys and dark-eyed Madonnas, staring at you from one corner of the studio, suggested Marillo. Oily brown shadows of faces, with a lurid streak in the wrong place, meant Rembrandt. Buxom ladies and dropsical infants, Rubens, and Turner appeared in tempests of blue thunder, orange lightning, brown rain, and purple clouds, with a tomato-colored splash in the middle, which might be the sun or a buoy, a sailor's shirt, or a king's robe, as the spectator pleased. Charcoal portraits came next, and the entire family hung in a row, looking as wild and crocky as if just evoked from a coal bin. Softened into crayon sketches, they did better, for the likenesses were good, and Amy's hair, Joe's nose, Meg's mouth, and Lori's eyes were pronounced wonderfully fine. A return to clay and plaster followed, and ghostly casts of her acquaintances haunted corners of the house or tumbled off closet shelves onto people's heads. Children were enticed in as models till their incoherent accounts of her mysterious doings caused Miss Amy to be regarded in the light of a young ogress. Her efforts in this line, however, were brought to an abrupt close by an untoward accident, which quenched her ardor. Other models failing her for a time, she undertook to cast her own pretty foot, and the family were one day alarmed by an unearthly bumping and screaming, and running to the rescue, found the young enthusiast hopping wildly about the shed, with her foot held fast in a pan full of plaster, which had hardened with unexpected rapidity. With much difficulty and some danger, she was dug out, for Joe was so overcome with laughter while she excavated that her knife went too far, cut the poor foot, 
and left a lasting memorial of one artistic attempt at least. After this, Amy subsided, till a mania for sketching from nature set her to haunting river, field, and wood, for picturesque studies, and sighing for ruins to copy. She caught endless colds sitting on damp grass to book a delicious bit, composed of a stone, a stump, one mushroom, and a broken mulling stalk, or a heavenly mass of clouds, that looked like a choice display of feather beds when done. She sacrificed her complexion floating on the river in the midsummer sun to study light and shade, and got a wrinkle over her nose, trying after points of sight, or whatever the squint and string performance is called. If genius is eternal patience, as Michelangelo affirms, Amy certainly had some claim to the divine attribute, for she persevered in spite of all obstacles, failures, and discouragements, firmly believing that in time she should do something worthy to be called high art. She was learning, doing, and enjoying other things, meanwhile, for she had resolved to be an attractive and accomplished woman, even if she never became a great artist. Here, she succeeded better, for she was one of those happily created beings who please without effort, make friends everywhere, and take life so gracefully and easily that less fortunate souls are tempted to believe that such are born under a lucky star. Everybody liked her, for among her good gifts was tact. She had an instinctive sense of what was pleasing and proper, always said the right thing to the right person, did just what suited the time and place, and was so self-possessed that her sisters used to say, if Amy went to court without any rehearsal beforehand, she'd know exactly what to do. One of her weaknesses was a desire to move in our best society, without being quite sure what the best really was. Money, position, fashionable accomplishments, and elegant manners were most desirable things in her eyes, and she liked to associate with those who possessed them, often mistaking the false for the true, and admiring what was not admirable. Never forgetting that by birth she was a gentlewoman, she cultivated her aristocratic tastes and feelings so that when the opportunity came, she might be ready to take the place from which poverty now excluded her. My lady, as her friends called her, sincerely desired to be a genuine lady, and was so at heart, but had yet to learn that money cannot buy refinement of nature, that rank does not always confer nobility, and that true breeding makes itself felt in spite of external drawbacks. I want to ask a favor of you, Mama, Amy said, coming in with an important air one day. Well, little girl, what is it? replied her mother, in whose eyes the stately young lady still remained, the baby. Our drawing class breaks up next week, and before the girls separate for the summer, I want to ask them out here for a day. They are wild to see the river, sketch the broken bridge, and copy some of the things they admire in my book. They have been very kind to me in many ways, and I am grateful, for they are all rich, and know I am poor, yet they never made any difference. Why should they? And Mrs. March put the question with what the girls called her Maria Teresa Eyre. You know as well as I that it does make a difference with nearly everyone, so don't ruffle up like a dear motherly hen when your chickens get pecked by smarter birds. The ugly duckling turned out a swan, you know. And Amy smiled without bitterness, for she possessed a happy temper and hopeful spirit. Mrs. March laughed and smoothed down her maternal pride as she asked, Well, my swan, what is your plan? I should like to ask the girls out to lunch next week, to take them a drive to the places they want to see, a row on the river, perhaps, and make a little artistic fate for them. That looks feasible. What do you want for lunch? Cake, sandwiches, fruit and coffee will be all that is necessary, I suppose. Oh dear, no. We must have cold tongue and chicken, French chocolate and ice cream besides. The girls are used to such things, and I want my lunch to be proper and elegant, though I do work for my living. How many young ladies are there? asked her mother, beginning to look sober. Twelve or fourteen in the class, but I dare say they won't all come. Bless me, child, you will have to charter an omnibus to carry them about. Why, mother, how can you think of such a thing? Not more than six or eight will probably come, so I shall hire a beach wagon and borrow Mr. Lawrence's cherry bounce. Hannah's pronunciation of Charabanc. All this will be expensive, Amy. Not very. I've calculated the cost, and I'll pay for it myself. Don't you think, dear, that as these girls are used to such things, and the best we can do will be nothing new, 
that some simpler plan would be pleasanter to them as a change, if nothing more, and much better for us than buying or borrowing what we don't need and attempting a style not in keeping with our circumstances. If I can't have it as I like, I don't care to have it at all. I know that I can carry it out perfectly well if you and the girls will help a little, and I don't see why I can't if I'm willing to pay for it, said Amy, with the decision which opposition was apt to change into obstinacy. Mrs. March knew that experience was an excellent teacher, and when it was possible, she left her children to learn alone the lessons which she would gladly have made easier if they had not objected to taking advice as much as they did Salts and Senna. Very well, Amy. If your heart is set upon it, and you see your way through without too great an outlay of money, time, and temper, I'll say no more. Talk it over with the girls, and whichever way you decide, I'll do my best to help you. Thanks, Mother. You are always so kind. And away went Amy to lay her plan before her sisters. Meg agreed at once, and promised her aid, gladly offering anything she possessed, from her little house itself to her very best salt spoons. But Joe frowned upon the whole project, and would have nothing to do with it at first. Why in the world should you spend your money, worry your family, and turn the house upside down for a parcel of girls who don't care a sixpence for you? I thought you had too much pride and sense to truckle to any mortal woman just because she wears French boots and rides in a coupé, said Joe, who, being called from the tragical climax of her novel, was not in the best mood for social enterprises. I don't truckle, and I hate being patronized as much as you do, returned Amy indignantly, for the two still jangled when such questions arose. The girls do care for me, and I for them, and there's a great deal of kindness and sense and talent among them, in spite of what you call fashionable nonsense. You don't care to make people like you, to go into good society, and cultivate your manners and tastes. I do, and I mean to make the most of every chance that comes. You can go through the world with your elbows out and your nose in the air and call it independence if you like. That's not my way. When Amy wetted her tongue and freed her mind, she usually got the best of it, for she seldom failed to have common sense on her side, while Joe carried her love of liberty and hate of conventionalities to such an unlimited extent that she naturally found herself worsted in an argument. Amy's definition of Joe's idea of independence was such a good hit that both burst out laughing, and the discussion took a more amiable turn. Much against her will, Joe at length consented to sacrifice a day to Mrs. Grundy and help her sister through what she regarded as a nonsensical business. The invitations were sent, nearly all accepted, and the following Monday was set apart for the grand event. Hannah was out of humor because her week's work was deranged and prophesied that E.F. the washin' and ironin' weren't done, regular nothin' would go well anywheres. This hitch in the mainspring of the domestic machinery had a bad effect upon the whole concern, but Amy's motto was Neil Desperandum, and having made up her mind what to do, she proceeded to do it in spite of all obstacles. To begin with, Hannah's cooking didn't turn out well. The chicken was tough, the tongue too salt, and the chocolate wouldn't froth properly. Then the cake and ice cost more than Amy expected, so did the wagon, and various other expenses, which seemed trifling at the outset, counted up rather alarmingly afterward. Beth got cold and took to her bed. Meg had an unusual number of callers to keep her at home, and Joe was in such a divided state of mind that her breakages, accidents, and mistakes were uncommonly numerous, serious, and trying. If it hadn't been for mother, I never should have got through, as Amy declared afterward, and gratefully remembered when the best joke of the season was entirely forgotten by everybody else. If it was not fair on Monday, the young ladies were to come on Tuesday, an arrangement which aggravated Joe and Hannah to the last degree. On Monday morning, the weather was in that undecided state which is more exasperating than a steady pour. It drizzled a little, shone a little, blew a little, and didn't make up its mind till it was too late for anyone else to make up theirs. Amy was up at dawn, hustling people out of their beds and through their breakfasts, that the house might be got in order. The parlor struck her as looking uncommonly shabby, but without stopping to sigh for what she had not, she skillfully made the best of what she had, arranging chairs over the worn places in the carpet, covering stains on the walls with pictures framed in ivy, and filling up empty corners with homemade statuary, which gave an artistic air to the room, as did the lovely vases of flowers Joe scattered about. 
The lunch looked charmingly, and as she surveyed it, she sincerely hoped it would taste well, and that the borrowed glass, china, and silver would get safely home again. The carriages were promised, Meg and Mother were all ready to do the honors, Beth was able to help Hannah behind the scenes, Joe had engaged to be as lively and amiable as an absent mind, an aching head, and a very decided disapproval of everybody and everything would allow. And, as she wearily dressed, Amy cheered herself with anticipations of the happy moment, when, lunch safely over, she should drive away with her friends for an afternoon of artistic delights. For the cherry bounce and the broken bridge were her strong points. Then came two hours of suspense, during which she vibrated from parlor to porch, while public opinion varied like the weathercock. A smart shower at eleven had evidently quenched the enthusiasm of the young ladies who were to arrive at twelve, for nobody came. And at two, the exhausted family sat down in a blaze of sunshine to consume the perishable portions of the feast that nothing might be lost. No doubt about the weather today. They will certainly come, so we must fly round and be ready for them, said Amy, as the sun woke her next morning. She spoke briskly, but in her secret soul she wished she had said nothing about Tuesday, for her interest, like her cake, was getting a little stale. I can't get any lobsters, so you will have to do without salad today, said Mr. March, coming in half an hour later, with an expression of placid despair. Use the chicken, then. The toughness won't matter in a salad, advised his wife. Hannah left it on the kitchen table a minute, and the kittens got at it. I'm very sorry, Amy, added Beth, who was still a patroness of cats. Then I must have a lobster, for tongue alone won't do said Amy decidedly. Shall I rush into town and demand one? asked Joe, with the magnanimity of a martyr. You'd come bringing it home under your arm, without any paper, just to try me. I'll go myself, answered Amy, whose temper was beginning to fail. Shrouded in a thick veil and armed with a genteel traveling basket, she departed, feeling that a cool drive would soothe her ruffled spirit and fit her for the labors of the day. After some delay, the object of her desire was procured, likewise a bottle of dressing, to prevent further loss of time at home, and off she drove again, well pleased with her own forethought. As the omnibus contained only one other passenger, a sleepy old lady, Amy pocketed her veil and beguiled the tedium of the way by trying to find out where all her money had gone to. So busy was she with her card full of refractory figures that she did not observe a newcomer who entered without stopping the vehicle till a masculine voice said, Good morning, Miss March. And looking up, she beheld one of Lori's most elegant college friends. Fervently hoping that he would get out before she did, Amy utterly ignored the basket at her feet and, congratulating herself that she had on her new traveling dress, returned the young man's greeting with her usual suavity and spirit. They got on excellently, for Amy's chief care was soon set at rest by learning that the gentleman would leave first, and she was chatting away in a peculiarly lofty strain when the old lady got out. In stumbling to the door, she upset the basket, and, oh, horror, the lobster, in all its vulgar size and brilliancy, was revealed to the high-born eyes of a tutor. By Jove, she's forgotten her dinner, cried the unconscious youth, poking the scarlet monster into its place with his cane, and preparing to hand out the basket after the old lady. Please don't, it's, it's mine, murmured Amy, with a face nearly as red as her fish. Oh, really? I beg pardon. It's an uncommonly fine one, isn't it? said Tudor, with great presence of mind, and an air of sober interest that did credit to his breeding. Amy recovered herself in a breath, set her basket boldly on the seat, and said, laughing, Don't you wish you were to have some of the salad he's to make, and to see the charming young ladies who are to eat it? Now that was tact for two of the ruling foibles of the masculine mind were touched. The lobster was instantly surrounded by a halo of pleasing reminiscences, and curiosity about the charming young ladies diverted his mind from the comical mishap. I suppose he'll laugh and joke over it with Lori, but I shan't see them. That's a comfort, thought Amy, as Tudor bowed and departed. She did not mention this meeting at home, though she discovered that, thanks to the upset, her new dress was much damaged by the rivulets of dressing that meandered down the skirt, but went through with the preparations, which now seemed more irksome than before, and at twelve o'clock all was ready again. 
Feeling that the neighbors were interested in her movements, she wished to efface the memory of yesterday's failure by a grand success today, so she ordered the cherry bounce and drove away in state to meet and escort her guests to the banquet. There's the rumble, they're coming. I'll go into the porch to meet them. It looks hospitable, and I want the poor child to have a good time after all her trouble, said Mrs. March, suiting the action to the word. But after one glance, she retired with an indescribable expression, for, looking quite lost in the big carriage, sat Amy and one young lady. Run, Beth, and help Hannah clear half the things off the table. It will be too absurd to put a luncheon for twelve before a single girl, cried Joe, hurrying away to the lower regions, too excited to stop even for a laugh. In came Amy, quite calm and delightfully cordial to the one guest who had kept her promise. The rest of the family, being of a dramatic turn, played their parts equally well, and Miss Elliot found them a most hilarious set, for it was impossible to entirely control the merriment which possessed them. The remodeled lunch being gaily partaken of, the studio and garden visited, and art discussed with enthusiasm, Amy ordered a buggy, alas for the elegant cherry bounce, and drove her friend quietly about the neighborhood till sunset, when the party went out. As she came walking in, looking very tired, but as composed as ever, she observed that every vestige of the unfortunate fate had disappeared, except a suspicious pucker about the corners of Joe's mouth. "'You've had a lovely afternoon for your drive, dear,' said her mother, as respectfully as if the whole twelve had come. "'Miss Elliot is a very sweet girl, and seemed to enjoy herself, I thought,' observed Beth with unusual warmth. "'Could you spare me some of your cake? I really need some. I have so much company, and I can't make such delicious stuff as yours.' asked Meg soberly. Take it all. I'm the only one here who likes sweet things, and it will mold before I can dispose of it, answered Amy, thinking with a sigh of the generous store she had laid in for such an end as this. It's a pity Lori isn't here to help us, began Joe, as they sat down to ice cream and salad for the second time in two days. A warning look from her mother checked any further remarks, and the whole family ate in heroic silence, till Mr. March mildly observed, Salad was one of the favorite dishes of the ancients, and Evelyn. Here, a general explosion of laughter cut short the history of salads, to the great surprise of the learned gentleman. Bundle everything into a basket and send it to the Hummels. Germans like messes. I'm sick of the sight of this, and there's no reason you should all die of a surfeit because I've been a fool, cried Amy, wiping her eyes. I thought I should have died when I saw you two girls rattling about in the what-you-call-it, like two little colonels in a very big nutshell, and mother waiting in state to receive the throng, sighed Joe, quite spent with laughter. I'm very sorry you were disappointed, dear, but we all did our best to satisfy you, said Mrs. March, in a tone full of motherly regret. I am satisfied. I've done what I undertook, and it's not my fault that it failed. I comfort myself with that, said Amy, with a little quiver in her voice. I thank you all very much for helping me, and I'll thank you still more if you won't allude to it for a month at least. No one did for several months, but the word fate always produced a general smile, and Lori's birthday gift to Amy was a tiny coral lobster in the shape of a charm for her watch guard. Chapter 27 Literary Lessons Fortune suddenly smiled upon Joe and dropped a good luck penny in her path. Not a golden penny exactly, but I doubt if half a million would have given more real happiness than did the little sum that came to her in this wise. Every few weeks she would shut herself up in her room, put on her scribbling suit, and fall into a vortex, as she expressed it, writing away at her novel with all her heart and soul, for till that was finished she could find no peace. Her scribbling suit consisted of a black woolen pinafore on which she could wipe her pen at will, and a cap of the same material, adorned with a cheerful red bow, into which she bundled her hair when the decks were cleared for action. This cap was a beacon to the inquiring eyes of her family, who during these periods kept their distance, merely popping in their heads semi-occasionally, to ask with interest, Does genius burn, Joe? They did not always venture even to ask this question, but took an observation of the cap and judged accordingly. If this expressive article of dress was drawn low upon the forehead, it was a sign that hard work was going on. In exciting moments, it was pushed rakishly askew, and when despair seized the author, it was plucked wholly off and cast upon the floor. 
At such times the intruder silently withdrew, and not until the red bow was seen gaily erect upon the gifted brow did anyone dare address Joe. She did not think herself a genius by any means, but when the writing fit came on, she gave herself up to it with entire abandon, and led a blissful life, unconscious of want, care, or bad weather, while she sat safe and happy in an imaginary world, full of friends almost as real and dear to her as any in the flesh. Sleep forsook her eyes, meals stood untasted, day and night were all too short to enjoy the happiness which blessed her only at such times, and made these hours worth living, even if they bore no other fruit. The divine afflatus usually lasted a week or two, and then she emerged from her vortex, hungry, sleepy, cross, or despondent. She was just recovering from one of these attacks when she was prevailed upon to escort Miss Crocker to a lecture, and in return for her virtue was rewarded with a new idea. It was a people's course, the lecture on the pyramids, and Joe rather wondered at the choice of such a subject for such an audience, but took it for granted that some great social evil would be remedied, or some great want supplied by unfolding the glories of the pharaohs, to an audience whose thoughts were busy with the price of coal and flour, and whose lives were spent in trying to solve harder riddles than that of the Sphinx. They were early, and while Miss Crocker set the heel of her stocking, Joe amused herself by examining the faces of the people who occupied the seat with them. On her left were two matrons, with massive foreheads and bonnets to match, discussing woman's rights and making tatting. Beyond sat a pair of humble lovers, artlessly holding each other by the hand, a somber spinster eating peppermints out of a paper bag, and an old gentleman taking his preparatory nap behind a yellow bandana. On her right, her only neighbor was a studious-looking lad absorbed in a newspaper. It was a pictorial sheet, and Joe examined the work of art nearest her, idly wondering what unfortuitous concatenation of circumstances needed the melodramatic illustration of an Indian in full war costume, tumbling over a precipice with a wolf at his throat, while two infuriated young gentlemen, with unnaturally small feet and big eyes, were stabbing each other close by, and a disheveled female was flying away in the background with her mouth wide open. Pausing to turn a page, the lad saw her looking, and with boyish good nature, offered half his paper, saying bluntly, Want to read it? That's a first-rate story. Joe accepted it with a smile, for she had never outgrown her liking for lads, and soon found herself involved in the usual labyrinth of love, mystery, and murder, for the story belonged to that class of light literature in which the passions have a holiday, and when the author's invention fails, a grand catastrophe clears the stage of one half the dramatis personae, leaving the other half to exult over their downfall. Prime, isn't it? asked the boy, as her eye went down the last paragraph of her portion. I think you and I could do as well as that if we tried, returned Joe amused at his admiration of the trash. I should think I was a pretty lucky chap if I could. She makes a good living out of such stories, they say. And he pointed to the name of Mrs. Slang Northberry, under the title of the tale. Do you know her? asked Joe, with sudden interest. No, but I read all her pieces, and I know a fellow who works in the office where this paper is printed. Do you say she makes a good living out of stories like this? And Joe looked more respectfully at the agitated group and thickly sprinkled exclamation points that adorned the page. Guess she does! She knows just what folks like, and gets paid well for writing it. Here the lecture began, but Joe heard very little of it, for while Prophet Sands was prosing away about Belzoni, Cheops, Scarabay, and Hieroglyphics, she was covertly taking down the address of the paper and boldly resolving to try for the hundred-dollar prize offered in its columns for a sensational story. By the time the lecture ended and the audience awoke, she had built up a splendid fortune for herself, not the first founded upon paper, and was already deep in the concoction of her story, being unable to decide whether the duel should come before the elopement or after the murder. She said nothing of her plan at home, but fell to work next day, much to the disquiet of her mother, who always looked a little anxious when genius took to burning. Jo had never tried the style before, contenting herself with very mild romances for the spread eagle. Her theatrical experience and miscellaneous reading were of service now, for they gave her some idea of dramatic effect and supplied plot, language, and costumes. Her story was as full of desperation and despair as her limited acquaintance with those uncomfortable emotions enabled her to make it, and, having located it in Lisbon, 
she wound up with an earthquake as a striking and appropriate denouement. The manuscript was privately dispatched, accompanied by a note, modestly saying that if the tale didn't get the prize, which the writer hardly dared expect, she would be very glad to receive any sum it might be considered worth. Six weeks is a long time to wait, and a still longer time for a girl to keep a secret, but Joe did both, and was just beginning to give up all hope of ever seeing her manuscript again, when a letter arrived which almost took her breath away, for on opening it, a check for a hundred dollars fell into her lap. For a minute, she stared at it as if it had been a snake, then she read her letter and began to cry. If the amiable gentleman who wrote that kindly note could have known what intense happiness he was giving a fellow creature, I think he would devote his leisure hours, if he has any, to that amusement. For Joe valued the letter more than the money, because it was encouraging. And after years of effort, it was so pleasant to find that she had learned to do something, though it was only to write a sensation story. A prouder young woman was seldom seen than she, when, having composed herself, she electrified the family by appearing before them with the letter in one hand, the check in the other, announcing that she had won the prize. Of course, there was a great jubilee, and when the story came, everyone read and praised it, though after her father had told her that the language was good, the romance fresh and hearty, and the tragedy quite thrilling, he shook his head and said in his unworldly way, You can do better than this, Joe. Aim at the highest, and never mind the money. I think the money is the best part of it. What will you do with such a fortune? asked Amy, regarding the magic slip of paper with a reverential eye. Send Beth and Mother to the seaside for a month or two, answered Joe promptly. Oh, how splendid! No, I can't do it, dear. It would be so selfish, cried Beth, who had clapped her thin hands and taken a long breath, as if pining for fresh ocean breezes, then stopped herself and motioned away the check which her sister waved before her. Ah, but you shall go. I've set my heart on it. That's what I tried for, and that's why I succeeded. I never get on when I think of myself alone, so it will help me to work for you, don't you see? Besides, Marmy needs the change, and she won't leave you, so you must go. Won't it be fun to see you come home plump and rosy again? Hurrah for Dr. Joe, who always cures her patients. To the seaside they went, after much discussion, and though Beth didn't come home as plump and rosy as could be desired, she was much better, while Mrs. March declared she felt ten years younger. So Joe was satisfied with the investment of her prize money and fell to work with a cheery spirit, bent on earning more of those delightful checks. She did earn several that year, and began to feel herself a power in the house, for by the magic of a pen, her rubbish turned into comforts for them all. The duke's daughter paid the butcher's bill, a phantom hand put down a new carpet, and the curse of the Coventries proved the blessing of the marches in the way of groceries and gowns. Wealth is certainly a most desirable thing, but poverty has its sunny side, and one of the sweet uses of adversity is the genuine satisfaction which comes from hearty work of head or hand. And to the inspiration of necessity, we owe half the wise, beautiful, and useful blessings of the world. Joe enjoyed a taste of this satisfaction and ceased to envy richer girls, taking great comfort in the knowledge that she could supply her own wants and need ask no one for a penny. Little notice was taken of her stories, but they found a market, and encouraged by this fact, she resolved to make a bold stroke for fame and fortune. Having copied her novel for the fourth time, read it to all her confidential friends, and submitted it with fear and trembling to three publishers, she at last disposed of it, on condition that she would cut it down one-third and omit all the parts which she particularly admired. Now I must either bundle it back into my tin kitchen to mold, pay for printing it myself, or chop it up to suit purchasers, and get what I can for it. Fame is a very good thing to have in the house, but cash is more convenient. So I wish to take the sense of the meeting on this important subject, said Joe, calling a family council. Don't spoil your book, my girl, for there is more in it than you know, and the idea is well worked out. Let it wait and ripen, was her father's advice. And he practiced as he preached, having waited patiently thirty years for fruit of his own to ripen, and being in no haste to gather it, even now, when it was sweet and mellow. It seems to me that Joe will profit more by making the trial than by waiting, said Mrs. March. Criticism is the best test of such work, for it will show her both unsuspected merits and faults, 
and help her to do better next time. We are too partial, but the praise and blame of outsiders will prove useful, even if she gets but little money. Yes, said Joe, knitting her brows. That's just it. I've been fussing over the thing so long, I really don't know whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. It will be a great help to have cool, impartial persons take a look at it and tell me what they think of it. I wouldn't leave out a word of it. You'll spoil it if you do, for the interest of the story is more in the minds than in the actions of the people, and it will be all a muddle if you don't explain as you go on, said Meg, who firmly believed that this book was the most remarkable novel ever written. But Mr. Allen says, leave out the explanations, make it brief and dramatic, and let the characters tell the story, interrupted Joe, turning to the publisher's note. Do as he tells you, he knows what will sell and we don't. Make a good, popular book and get as much money as you can. By and by, when you've got a name, you can afford to digress and have philosophical and metaphysical people in your novels, said Amy, who took a strictly practical view of the subject. Well, said Joe, laughing, if my people are philosophical and metaphysical, it isn't my fault, for I know nothing about such things, except what I hear father say sometimes. If I've got some of his wise ideas jumbled up with my romance, so much the better for me. Now, Beth, what do you say? I should so like to see it printed soon, was all Beth said, and smiled in saying it. But there was an unconscious emphasis on the last word, and a wistful look in the eyes that never lost their childlike candor, which chilled Joe's heart for a minute with a foreboding fear, and decided her to make her little venture soon. So, with Spartan firmness, the young authoress laid her firstborn on her table and chopped it up as ruthlessly as any ogre. In the hope of pleasing everyone, she took everyone's advice, and, like the old man and his donkey in the fable, suited nobody. Her father liked the metaphysical streak which had unconsciously got into it. So that was allowed to remain, though she had her doubts about it. Her mother thought that there was a trifle too much description. Out, therefore, it nearly all came, and with it, many necessary links in the story. Meg admired the tragedy, so Joe piled up the agony to suit her, while Amy objected to the fun, and, with the best intentions in life, Joe quenched the sprightly scenes which relieved the somber character of the story. Then, to complete the ruin, she cut it down one-third, and confidingly sent the poor little romance, like a picked robin, out into the big, busy world to try its fate. Well, it was printed, and she got three hundred dollars for it. Likewise, plenty of praise and blame, both so much greater than she expected that she was thrown into a state of bewilderment, from which it took her some time to recover. You said, Mother, that criticism would help me. But how can it, when it's so contradictory that I don't know whether I've written a promising book or broken all the Ten Commandments? cried poor Joe, turning over a heap of notices, the perusal of which filled her with pride and joy one minute, wrath and dire dismay the next. This man says, An exquisite book, full of truth, beauty, and earnestness. All is sweet, pure, and healthy, continued the perplexed authoress. The next, the theory of the book is bad, full of morbid fancies, spiritualistic ideas, and unnatural characters. Now, as I had no theory of any kind, don't believe in spiritualism, and copied my characters from life, I don't see how this critic can be right. Another says, it's one of the best American novels which has appeared for years. I know better than that. And the next asserts that, though it is original and written with great force and feeling, it is a dangerous book. Tisn't. Some make fun of it, some overpraise, and nearly all insist that I had a deep theory to expound when I only wrote it for the pleasure and the money. I wish I'd printed it whole or not at all, for I do hate to be so misjudged. Her family and friends administered comfort and commendation liberally, yet it was a hard time for sensitive, high-spirited Joe, who meant so well and had apparently done so ill. But it did her good, for those whose opinion had real value gave her the criticism which is an author's best education, and when the first soreness was over, she could laugh at her poor little book, yet believe in it still, and feel herself the wiser and stronger for the buffeting she had received. Not being a genius like Keats, it won't kill me, she said stoutly, and I've got the joke on my side after all, for the parts that were taken straight out of real life are denounced as impossible and absurd, 
and the scenes that I made up out of my own silly head are pronounced charmingly natural, tender, and true. So I'll comfort myself with that, and when I'm ready, I'll up again and take another. Domestic Experiences Break time equal sign 1, 5 s slash. Like most other young matrons, Meg began her married life with the determination to be a model housekeeper. John should find home a paradise, he should always see a smiling face, should fare sumptuously every day, and never know the loss of a button. She brought so much love, energy, and cheerfulness to the work that she could not but succeed, in spite of some obstacles. Her paradise was not a tranquil one, for the little woman fussed, was over-anxious to please, and bustled about like a true Martha, cumbered with many cares. She was too tired sometimes, even to smile. John grew dyspeptic after a course of dainty dishes and ungratefully demanded plain fare. As for buttons, she soon learned to wonder where they went, to shake her head over the carelessness of men, and to threaten to make him sew them on himself, and then see if his work would stand impatient tugs and clumsy fingers any better than hers. They were very happy, even after they discovered that they couldn't live on love alone. John did not find Meg's beauty diminished, though she beamed at him from behind the familiar coffee pot. Nor did Meg miss any of the romance from the daily parting, when her husband followed up his kiss with the tender inquiry, Shall I send home veal or mutton for dinner, darling? The little house ceased to be a glorified bower, but it became a home, and the young couple soon felt that it was a change for the better. At first, they played keep house and frolicked over it like children. Then John took steadily to business, feeling the cares of the head of a family upon his shoulders, and Meg laid by her cambric wrappers, put on a big apron and fell to work, as before said, with more energy than discretion. While the cooking mania lasted, she went through Mrs. Cornelius's receipt book as if it were a mathematical exercise, working out the problems with patience and care. Sometimes her family were invited in to help eat up a too bounteous feast of successes, or Lottie would be privately dispatched with a batch of failures, which were to be concealed from all eyes in the convenient stomachs of the little Hummels. An evening with John over the account books usually produced a temporary lull in the culinary enthusiasm, and a frugal fit would ensue, during which the poor man was put through a course of bread pudding, hash, and warmed-over coffee, which tried his soul, although he bore it with praiseworthy fortitude. Before the golden mean was found, however, Meg added to her domestic possessions what young couples seldom get on long without, a family jar. Fired with a housewifely wish to see her storeroom stocked with homemade preserves, she undertook to put up her own currant jelly. John was requested to order home a dozen or so of little pots and an extra quantity of sugar, for their own currants were ripe and were to be attended to at once. As John firmly believed that my wife was equal to anything and took a natural pride in her skill, he resolved that she should be gratified and their only crop of fruit laid by in a most pleasing form for winter use. Home came four dozen delightful little pots, half a barrel of sugar, and a small boy to pick the currants for her. With her pretty hair tucked into a little cap, arms bared to the elbow, and a checked apron which had a coquettish look in spite of the bib, the young housewife fell to work, feeling no doubts about her success. For hadn't she seen Hannah do it hundreds of times? The array of pots rather amazed her at first, but John was so fond of jelly, and the nice little jars would look so well on the top shelf that Meg resolved to fill them all and spent a long day picking, boiling, straining, and fussing over her jelly. She did her best. She asked advice of Mrs. Cornelius. She racked her brain to remember what Hannah did that she had left undone. She reboiled, resigard, and restrained. But that dreadful stuff wouldn't gel. She longed to run home, bib and all, and ask Mother to lend a hand. But John and she had agreed that they would never annoy anyone with their private worries, experiments, or quarrels. They had laughed over that last word, as if the idea it suggested was a most preposterous one. But they had held to their resolve, and whenever they could get on without help, they did so, and no one interfered, for Mrs. March had advised the plan. So Meg wrestled alone with the refractory sweetmeats all that hot summer day, and at five o'clock sat down in her topsy-turvy kitchen, wrung her bedaubed hands, lifted up her voice, and wept. Now, in the first flush of the new life, she had often said, my husband shall always feel free to bring a friend home whenever he likes. I shall always be prepared, 
There shall be no flurry, no scolding, no discomfort, but a neat house, a cheerful wife, and a good dinner. John, dear, never stop to ask my leave. Invite whom you please, and be sure of a welcome from me. How charming that was, to be sure. John quite glowed with pride to hear her say it, and felt what a blessed thing it was to have a superior wife. But, although they had had company from time to time, it never happened to be unexpected, and Meg had never had an opportunity to distinguish herself till now. It always happens so in this veil of tears. There is an inevitability about such things which we can only wonder at, deplore, and bear as we best can. If John had not forgotten all about the jelly, it really would have been unpardonable in him to choose that day, of all the days in the year, to bring a friend home to dinner unexpectedly. Congratulating himself that a handsome repast had been ordered that morning, feeling sure that it would be ready to the minute, and indulging in pleasant anticipations of the charming effect it would produce when his pretty wife came running out to meet him, he escorted his friend to his mansion with the irrepressible satisfaction of a young host and husband. It is a world of disappointments, as John discovered when he reached the dovecote. The front door usually stood hospitably open. Now it was not only shut, but locked, and yesterday's mud still adorned the steps. The parlor windows were closed and curtained, no picture of the pretty wife sewing on the piazza, in white, with a distracting little bow in her hair, or a bright-eyed hostess, smiling a shy welcome as she greeted her guest. Nothing of the sort, for not a soul appeared, but a sanguinary-looking boy asleep under the currant bushes. "'I'm afraid something has happened. Step into the garden, Scott, while I look up Mrs. Brooke,' said John, alarmed at the silence and solitude. Round the house he hurried, led by a pungent smell of burnt sugar, and Mr. Scott strolled after him, with a queer look on his face. He paused discreetly at a distance when Brooke disappeared, but he could both see and hear, and, being a bachelor, enjoyed the prospect mightily. In the kitchen reigned confusion and despair. One addition of jelly was trickled from pot to pot, another lay upon the floor, and a third was burning gaily on the stove. Lottie, with Teutonic phlegm, was calmly eating bread and currant wine, for the jelly was still in a hopelessly liquid state, while Mrs. Brooke, with her apron over her head, sat sobbing dismally. "'My dearest girl, what is the matter?' cried John, rushing in, with awful visions of scalded hands, sudden news of affliction, and secret consternation at the thought of the guest in the garden. "'Oh, John, I am so tired and hot and cross and worried. I've been at it till I'm all worn out. Do come and help me, or I shall die.' And the exhausted housewife cast herself upon his breast, giving him a sweet welcome in every sense of the word, for her pinafore had been baptized at the same time as the floor. "'What worries you, dear? Has anything dreadful happened?' asked the anxious John, tenderly kissing the crown of the little cap, which was all askew. "'Yes,' sobbed Meg despairingly. "'Tell me quick, then. Don't cry. I can bear anything better than that. Out with it, love. The—the the jelly won't gel, and I don't know what to do.' John Brooke laughed then, as he never dared to laugh afterward. And the derisive Scott smiled involuntarily as he heard the hearty peal, which put the finishing stroke to poor Meg's woe. Is that all? Fling it out of window, and don't bother any more about it. I'll buy you quartz if you want it. But for heaven's sake don't have hysterics, for I've brought Jack Scott home to dinner, and— John got no further, for Meg cast him off, and clasped her hands with a tragic gesture as she fell into a chair, exclaiming in a tone of mingled indignation, reproach, and dismay. A man to dinner, and everything in a mess! John Brooke, how could you do such a thing? Hush, he's in the garden. I forgot the confounded jelly, but it can't be helped now, said John, surveying the prospect with an anxious eye. You ought to have sent word or told me this morning, and you ought to have remembered how busy I was, continued Meg petulantly, for even turtle doves will peck when ruffled. I didn't know it this morning, and there was no time to send word, for I met him on the way out. I never thought of asking leave when you have always told me to do as I liked. I never tried it before, and hang me if I ever do again, added John with an aggrieved air. I should hope not. Take him away at once. I can't see him, and there isn't any dinner. Well, I like that. Where's the beef and vegetables I sent home, and the pudding you promised? cried John, rushing to the larder. I hadn't time to cook anything. 
I meant to dine at Mother's. I'm sorry, but I was so busy. And Meg's tears began again. John was a mild man, but he was human. And after a long day's work, to come home tired, hungry, and hopeful, to find a chaotic house, an empty table, and a crosswife was not exactly conducive to repose of mind or manner. He restrained himself, however, and the little squall would have blown over, but for one unlucky word. It's a scrape, I acknowledge, but if you will lend a hand, we'll pull through and have a good time yet. Don't cry, dear, but just exert yourself a bit and knock us up something to eat. We're both as hungry as hunters, so we shan't mind what it is. Give us the cold meat and bread and cheese. We won't ask for jelly. He meant it for a good-natured joke, but that one word sealed his fate. Meg thought it was too cruel to hint about her sad failure, and the last atom of patience vanished as he spoke. You must get yourself out of the scrape as you can. I'm too used up to exert myself for anyone. It's like a man to propose a bone and vulgar bread and cheese for company. I won't have anything of the sort in my house. Take that Scott up to Mother's and tell him I'm away, sick, dead, anything. I won't see him, and you two can laugh at me and my jelly as much as you like. You won't have anything else here. And having delivered her defiance all in one breath, Meg cast away her pinafore and precipitately left the field to bemoan herself in her own room. What those two creatures did in her absence, she never knew. But Mr. Scott was not taken up to mother's, and when Meg descended, after they had strolled away together, she found traces of a promiscuous lunch which filled her with horror. Lottie reported that they had eaten a much and greatly laughed, and the master bid her throw away all the sweet stuff and hide the pots. Meg longed to go and tell mother, but a sense of shame at her own shortcomings, of loyalty to John, who might be cruel, but nobody should know it, restrained her, and after a summary clearing up, she dressed herself prettily and sat down to wait for John to come and be forgiven. Unfortunately, John didn't come, not seeing the matter in that light. He had carried it off as a good joke with Scott, excused his little wife as well as he could, and played the host so hospitably that his friend enjoyed the impromptu dinner and promised to come again. But John was angry, though he did not show it. He felt that Meg had got him into a scrape and then deserted him in his hour of need. It wasn't fair to tell a man to bring folks home any time, with perfect freedom, and when he took you at your word, to flame up and blame him, and leave him in the lurch, to be laughed at or pitied. No, by George, it wasn't, and Meg must know it. He had fumed inwardly during the feast, but when the flurry was over, and he strolled home after seeing Scott off, a milder mood came over him. Poor little thing, it was hard upon her when she tried so heartily to please me. She was wrong, of course, but then she was young. I must be patient and teach her. He hoped she had not gone home, he hated gossip and interference. For a minute he was ruffled again at the mere thought of it, and then the fear that Meg would cry herself sick softened his heart and sent him on at a quicker pace, resolving to be calm and kind, but firm, quite firm, and show her where she had failed in her duty to her spouse. Meg likewise resolved to be calm and kind, but firm, and show him his duty. She longed to run to meet him and beg pardon and be kissed and comforted, as she was sure of being. But, of course, she did nothing of the sort, and when she saw John coming, began to hum quite naturally, as she rocked and sewed, like a lady of leisure in her best parlor. John was a little disappointed not to find a tender Niobe, but, feeling that his dignity demanded the first apology, he made none, only came leisurely in, and laid himself upon the sofa, with the singularly relevant remark, we are going to have a new moon, my dear. I've no objection, was Meg's equally soothing remark. A few other topics of general interest were introduced by Mr. Brooke and wet blanketed by Mrs. Brooke and conversation languished. John went to one window, unfolded his paper, and wrapped himself in it, figuratively speaking. Meg went to the other window and sewed as if new rosettes for her slippers were among the necessaries of life. Neither spoke. Both looked quite calm and firm, and both felt desperately uncomfortable. Oh, dear, thought Meg. Married life is very trying, and does need infinite patience, as well as love, as mother says. The word mother suggested other maternal counsels, given long ago, and received with unbelieving protests. John is a good man, but he has his faults, and you must learn to see and bear with them, 
remembering your own. He is very decided, but never will be obstinate if you reason kindly, not oppose impatiently. He is very accurate and particular about the truth, a good trait, though you call him fussy. Never deceive him by look or word, Meg, and he will give you the confidence you deserve, the support you need. He has a temper, not like ours, one flash and then all over. But the white, still anger, that is seldom stirred, but once kindled, is hard to quench. Be careful, very careful, not to wake this anger against yourself, for peace and happiness depend on keeping his respect. Watch yourself, be the first to ask pardon if you both err, and guard against the little peaks, misunderstandings, and hasty words that often pave the way for bitter sorrow and regret. These words came back to Meg, as she sat sewing in the sunset, especially the last. This was the first serious disagreement. Her own hasty speeches sounded both silly and unkind, as she recalled them, her own anger looked childish now, and thoughts of poor John coming home to such a scene quite melted her heart. She glanced at him with tears in her eyes, but he did not see them. She put down her work and got up, thinking, I will be the first to say, forgive me. But he did not seem to hear her. She went very slowly across the room, for pride was hard to swallow, and stood by him, but he did not turn his head. For a minute, she felt as if she really couldn't do it. Then came the thought, This is the beginning. I'll do my part and have nothing to reproach myself with. And stooping down, she softly kissed her husband on the forehead. Of course that settled it. The penitent kiss was better than a world of words, and John had her on his knee in a minute, saying tenderly, It was too bad to laugh at the poor little jelly pots. Forgive me, dear. I never will again. But he did. Oh, bless you. Yes, hundreds of times, and so did Meg, both declaring that it was the sweetest jelly they ever made, for family peace was preserved in that little family jar. After this, Meg had Mr. Scott to dinner by special invitation, and served him up a pleasant feast without a cooked wife for the first course, on which occasion she was so gay and gracious, and made everything go off so charmingly, that Mr. Scott told John he was a happy fellow, and shook his head over the hardships of bachelorhood all the way home. In the autumn, new trials and experiences came to Meg. Sally Moffat renewed her friendship, was always running out for a dish of gossip at the little house, or inviting that poor dear to come in and spend the day at the big house. It was pleasant, for in dull weather Meg often felt lonely. All were busy at home, John absent till night, and nothing to do but sew or read or potter about, so it naturally fell out that Meg got into the way of gadding and gossiping with her friend. Seeing Sally's pretty things made her long for such, and pity herself because she had not got them. Sally was very kind, and often offered her the coveted trifles, but Meg declined them, knowing that John wouldn't like it, and then this foolish little woman went and did what John disliked infinitely worse. She knew her husband's income, and she loved to feel that he trusted her, not only with his happiness, but what some men seem to value more, his money. She knew where it was, was free to take what she liked, and all he asked was that she should keep account of every penny, pay bills once a month, and remember that she was a poor man's wife. Till now, she had done well, been prudent and exact, kept her little account books neatly, and showed them to him monthly without fear. But that autumn, the serpent got into Meg's paradise, and tempted her, like many a modern Eve, not with apples, but with dress. Meg didn't like to be pitied and made to feel poor. It irritated her, but she was ashamed to confess it, and now and then she tried to console herself by buying something pretty, so that Sally needn't think she had to economize. She always felt wicked after it, for the pretty things were seldom necessaries. But then they cost so little, it wasn't worth worrying about. So the trifles increased unconsciously, and in the shopping excursions she was no longer a passive looker-on. But the trifles cost more than one would imagine, and when she cast up her accounts at the end of the month, the sum total rather scared her. John was busy that month and left the bills to her. The next month he was absent. But the third, he had a grand quarterly settling up, and Meg never forgot it. A few days before she had done a dreadful thing, and it weighed upon her conscience. Sally had been buying silks, and Meg longed for a new one, just a handsome light one for parties. Her black silk was so common, 
and thin things for evening wear were only proper for girls. Aunt March usually gave the sisters a present of $25 apiece at New Year. That was only a month to wait, and here was a lovely violet silk going at a bargain, and she had the money if she only dared to take it. John always said what was his was hers, but would he think it right to spend not only the prospective five and twenty, but another five and twenty out of the household fund? That was the question. Sally had urged her to do it, had offered to loan the money, and with the best intentions in life, had tempted Meg beyond her strength. In an evil moment, the shopman held up the lovely shimmering folds and said, A bargain, I assure you, ma'am. She answered, I'll take it. And it was cut off and paid for, and Sally had exulted, and she had laughed as if it were a thing of no consequence, and driven away, feeling as if she had stolen something, and the police were after her. When she got home, she tried to assuage the pangs of remorse by spreading forth the lovely silk. But it looked less silvery now, didn't become her after all, and the words fifty dollars seemed stamped like a pattern down each breadth. She put it away, but it haunted her, not delightfully, as a new dress should, but dreadfully, like the ghost of a folly that was not easily laid. When John got out his books that night, Meg's heart sank, and for the first time in her married life, she was afraid of her husband. The kind, brown eyes looked as if they could be stern, and though he was unusually merry, she fancied he had found her out, but didn't mean to let her know it. The house bills were all paid, the books all in order. John had praised her and was undoing the old pocketbook which they called the bank, when Meg, knowing that it was quite empty, stopped his hand, saying nervously, You haven't seen my private expense book yet. John never asked to see it, but she always insisted on his doing so, and used to enjoy his masculine amazement at the queer things women wanted, and made him guess what piping was, demand fiercely the meaning of a hug-me-tight, or wonder how a little thing composed of three rosebuds, a bit of velvet, and a pair of strings, could possibly be a bonnet, and cost five or six dollars. That night he looked as if he would like the fun of quizzing her figures, and pretending to be horrified at her extravagance, as he often did, being particularly proud of his prudent wife. The little book was brought slowly out and laid down before him. Meg got behind his chair under pretense of smoothing the wrinkles out of his tired forehead, and standing there, she said, with her panic increasing with every word, John, dear, I'm ashamed to show you my book, for I've really been dreadfully extravagant lately. I go about so much I must have things, you know, and Sally advised my getting it, so I did, and my New Year's money will partly pay for it, but I was sorry after I'd done it, for I knew you'd think it wrong in me. John laughed and drew her round beside him, saying good-humoredly, Don't go and hide. I won't beat you if you have got a pair of killing boots. I'm rather proud of my wife's feet, and don't mind if she does pay eight or nine dollars for her boots, if they are good ones. That had been one of her last trifles, and John's eye had fallen on it as he spoke. Oh, what will he say when he comes to that awful fifty dollars? thought Meg with a shiver. It's worse than boots, it's a silk dress, she said, with the calmness of desperation, for she wanted the worst over. Well, dear, what is the dem total, as Mr. Mantellini says? That didn't sound like John, and she knew he was looking up at her with the straightforward look that she had always been ready to meet and answer with one as Frank till now. She turned the page and her head at the same time, pointing to the sum which would have been bad enough without the fifty, but which was appalling to her with that added. For a minute, the room was very still. Then John said slowly, but she could feel it cost him an effort to express no displeasure. Well, I don't know that fifty is much for a dress, with all the furbelows and notions you have to have to finish it off these days. It isn't made or trimmed, sighed Meg faintly, for a sudden recollection of the cost still to be incurred quite overwhelmed her. Twenty-five yards of silk seems a good deal to cover one small woman, but I've no doubt my wife will look as fine as Ned Moffat's when she gets it on, said John dryly. I know you are angry, John, but I can't help it. I don't mean to waste your money, and I didn't think those little things would count up so. I can't resist them when I see Sally buying all she wants and pitying me because I don't. I try to be contented, but it is hard, and I'm tired of being poor. The last words were spoken so low she thought he did not hear them, but he did, and they wounded him deeply, for he had denied himself many pleasures for Meg's sake. 
She could have bitten her tongue out the minute she had said it, for John pushed the books away and got up, saying, with a little quiver in his voice, I was afraid of this. I do my best, Meg. If he had scolded her, or even shaken her, it would not have broken her heart like those few words. She ran to him and held him close, crying with repentant tears. Oh, John, my dear, kind, hard-working boy, I didn't mean it. It was so wicked, so untrue and ungrateful. How could I say it? Oh, how could I say it? He was very kind, forgave her readily, and did not utter one reproach. But Meg knew that she had done and said a thing which would not be forgotten soon, although he might never allude to it again. She had promised to love him for better for worse, and then she, his wife, had reproached him with his poverty after spending his earnings recklessly. It was dreadful, and the worst of it was John went on so quietly afterward, just as if nothing had happened, except that he stayed in town later and worked at night when she had gone to cry herself to sleep. A week of remorse nearly made Meg sick, and the discovery that John had countermanded the order for his new greatcoat reduced her to a state of despair which was pathetic to behold. He had simply said, in answer to her surprised inquiries as to the change, I can't afford it, my dear. Meg said no more, but a few minutes after he found her in the hall, with her face buried in the old greatcoat, crying as if her heart would break. They had a long talk that night, and Meg learned to love her husband better for his poverty, because it seemed to have made a man of him, given him the strength and courage to fight his own way, and taught him a tender patience with which to bear and comfort the natural longings and failures of those he loved. Next day, she put her pride in her pocket, went to Sally, told the truth, and asked her to buy the silk as a favor. The good-natured Mrs. Moffat willingly did so, and had the delicacy not to make her a present of it immediately afterward. Then Meg ordered home the great coat, and when John arrived, she put it on and asked him how he liked her new silk gown. One can imagine what answer he made, how he received his present, and what a blissful state of things ensued. John came home early, Meg gadded no more, and that great coat was put on in the morning by a very happy husband and taken off at night by a most devoted little wife. So the year rolled round, and at midsummer there came to Meg a new experience, the deepest and tenderest of a woman's life. Lori came sneaking into the kitchen of the dovecote one Saturday with an excited face and was received with the clash of cymbals for Hannah clapped her hands with a saucepan in one and the cover in the other. "'How's the little mama? Where is everybody? Why didn't you tell me before I came home?' began Lori in a loud whisper. "'Happy as a queen, the dear. Every soul of em is upstairs a-worshipin'. We didn't want no hurricanes round. Now you go into the parlor, and I'll send em down to you.' With which somewhat involved reply, Hannah vanished, chuckling ecstatically. Presently Joe appeared, proudly bearing a flannel bundle laid forth upon a large pillow. Joe's face was very sober, but her eyes twinkled, and there was an odd sound in her voice of repressed emotion of some sort. Shut your eyes and hold out your arms, she said invitingly. Lori backed precipitately into a corner and put his hands behind him with an imploring gesture. No, thank you, I'd rather not. I shall drop it or smash it, as sure as fate. Then you shan't see your nevy, said Joe decidedly, turning as if to go. I will, I will. Only you must be responsible for damages. And, obeying orders, Lori heroically shut his eyes while something was put into his arms. A peal of laughter from Joe, Amy, Mrs. March, Hannah, and John caused him to open them the next minute, to find himself invested with two babies instead of one. No wonder they laughed for the expression of his face was droll enough to convulse a Quaker, as he stood and stared wildly from the unconscious innocence to the hilarious spectators, with such dismay that Joe sat down on the floor and screamed. "'Twins by Jupiter!' was all he said for a minute. Then, turning to the women with an appealing look that was comically piteous, he added, "'Take em quick, somebody. I'm going to laugh, and I shall drop em. John rescued his babies and marched up and down, with one on each arm, as if already initiated into the mysteries of baby tending, while Lori laughed till the tears ran down his cheeks. It's the best joke of the season, isn't it? I wouldn't have you told, for I set my heart on surprising you, and I flatter myself I've done it, said Joe when she got her breath. 
I never was more staggered in my life. Isn't it fun? Are they boys? What are you going to name them? Let's have another look. Hold me up, Joe, for upon my life it's one too many for me, returned Lori, regarding the infants with the air of a big, benevolent Newfoundland, looking at a pair of infantile kittens. Boy and girl, aren't they beauties? said the proud papa, beaming upon the little red squirmers as if they were unfledged angels. Most remarkable children I ever saw. Which is which? And Lori bent like a well-sweep to examine the prodigies. Amy put a blue ribbon on the boy and a pink on the girl. French fashion, so you can always tell. Besides, one has blue eyes and one brown. Kiss them, Uncle Teddy, said Wicked Joe. I'm afraid they mightn't like it, began Lori, with unusual timidity in such matters. Of course they will. They are used to it now. Do it this minute, sir, commanded Joe, fearing he might propose a proxy. Lori screwed up his face and obeyed with a gingerly peck at each little cheek that produced another laugh and made the babies squeal. There, I knew they didn't like it. That's the boy. See him kick. He hits out with his fists like a good one. Now then, young Brooke, pitch into a man of your own size, will you? cried Lori, delighted with a poke in the face from a tiny fist flapping aimlessly about. He's to be named John Lawrence and the girl Margaret after mother and grandmother. We shall call her Daisy, so as not to have two Megs, and I suppose the Manny will be Jack, unless we find a better name, said Amy with ant-like interest. Name him Demijohn, and call him Demi for short, said Lori. Daisy and Demi, just the thing. I knew Teddy would do it, cried Joe, clapping her hands. Teddy certainly had done it that time, for the babies were Daisy and Demi to the end of the chapter. Thank you for joining us for the narration of chapters 26 to 28 of Little Women. As we close this chapter on our journey with the March sisters, we're reminded of the timeless lessons and emotions that Louisa May Alcott has woven into the fabric of this classic novel. The story of Joe, Meg, Beth, and Amy continues to inspire and resonate with readers of all ages, reminding us of the beauty of family, the importance of dreams, and the strength found in togetherness. If you've enjoyed our time together and wish to continue exploring the depths of classic literature, Remember to subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell. This way, you'll always be updated with our latest episodes and literary explorations. And don't forget, as a token of our appreciation for your support and love for literature, we're offering you a free full-length audiobook from obsidianriver.com. Simply visit obsidianriver.com gift to claim your gift and discover more captivating stories. Thank you for watching, and until next time, Keep the stories of the March sisters close to your heart and let their journey inspire your own. Happy reading!